uh, kind of the, the central element of the gospel. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that this um, friend of mine uh, online posted that, that hate is not the opposite of love, but evil is the opposite of love, and I thought that is pretty, pretty deep. <coughs> because Satan, from the beginning, before Adam and Eve, Satan from the beginning has wanted to overthrow what God was and who God was and, and what he had, what authority he had over the universe. Uh, Satan didn't like it. He thought that he could do it a better way. And so there are some scriptures that point to, you know, a third of the angels cast down to earth. And of course we know that Satan uh, has, he is called the prince of power of the air. Um, this earth is where he roams and does his thing. And that's what led to Adam and Eve uh, dealing with Satan as a, I shouldn't say convincing them, uh, persuading them that maybe what God said wasn't actually what he meant. And he's been doing the same ever since. So we're going to talk about, uh, can you pull that up, Cassandra? I, did you look, look up in that folder see if it's in there? Of course, again, I forgot to do that. Um, but we're going to talk about our authority in Christ. We're just going to read through some scriptures. Our authority in Christ. And then we're going to talk about judging a little bit, just how we judge others. Um, and sometimes how we're on the receiving end of that judgment and how to deal with it. And then um, we're going to talk about how to forgive. Uh, how to overcome betrayal. I brought this book with me today. Ron Dupree, too many of you have known, passed away a few years ago. Uh, but he <laughs> he had a whole lot to say because he, he was just like the Allstate commercial. Uh, he had seen a thing or two. <laughs> <laughs> So he had a lot, a lot of wisdom to share when it comes to overcoming betrayal and, and knives in the back and, and even the appearance of those things. Um, so what, what kind of drove this this week was a couple of my friends, one, one from work and one that used to be from work, but it's now just somebody I uh, associate with, uh, had some somewhat traumatic experiences in their lives. You know, to them it was traumatic. To us, be like, okay, get over it, move on. Um, but, and, then, and then, of course, my adult children came home and mentioned that. And there's definitely opportunities within the family for one to feel you know, jaded or spited or whatever, uh, as you all may know if you have families. So, um, so that these things make me think, uh, is it working? Okay, look at that. What do you believe? Uh, so these things make me think, why is it so easy for us to get offended? Uh, or, not just offended, but sometimes we, most of the time, we assume that others just think the worst about us. We, we just assume it. We just assume that when that person said that thing, that they were looking deep in my soul and calling out the worst of my character. When most of the time, that's not really what the person is doing or saying, but that's the way we perceive it. Um, and, and in the end, a lot of this comes down to identity. Go ahead and flip to the next one. I, I think I just threw it there. Authority, judgment, betrayal. Uh, so what was it when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them so they don't know what they do. Right. Why was Jesus so comfortable with nails sticking through his arms and his feet and a crown of thorns on his head and thirsty as all get out and they offered him some vinegar and uh, had been beaten, hair pulled, stripes on his back. I mean, in a, in a horrible place, why was he able to say, forgive them? Like, who does that? Who does that? <laughs> so, and then Stephen, just a few years later, Stephen is being stoned for not uh, not going along with the flow of what the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders thought should happen, uh, and they and they tortured him. They stoned him to death, and he also said, "Forgive them." It, for, he goes, "I commend my spirit in your hands." Right? Um, I, I'm done with this life. I've done what you called me to do. And he didn't have a very long life, really. He, he ended pretty early. But he preached the gospel to the very end. Um, there is a... Go ahead and go to the next slide. I was able to find a picture of this. This says uh, Latimer and Ridley. These are two people that were martyred for the faith in 1563. There was a guy just before this, uh, 1550, Dr. Roland Taylor, who lived in a, an English village of uh, Hadley. Uh, when he finally came to the end of uh, his life, 
it was because he had been preaching the gospel and from his parish. It was, you know, things were very Catholic in those days across the world. This is the small village in England, outside of London, outside of Birmingham. Uh, and finally, the good news that he was spreading and preaching in his village, where good people accepted and loved heartily, they they read the scripture, they saw that what he was teaching was from the scripture, that it wasn't the Pope that was in charge of all things, it wasn't the Pope that dictated right and wrong, it was the scripture and the word of God. Uh, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't our duty to pay uh, homage or say certain prayers or whatever to be able to get out of man's judgment, but it was something that was already settled a long time ago on the cross. Um, and then when the communion, when you take this little bread and cup for communion, it wasn't actually, literally, the flesh of Jesus and the, and the blood of Jesus. It, it was a figurative thing, and it was okay to believe that. Like it didn't make it didn't make them less Christian. But the, the church at the time, the, you know, uh, the capital C church, or I guess the lowercase church, at the time made, made people like that feel like they were abandoning the faith if they believed those things. So he finally had to pay a price, and he went, uh, got arrested, went to London, went through all the courts. Clink prison, if you haven't heard of clink, a clink before, if you hear the jail being a clink, it's, it comes from a term of uh, prison in Europe. Um, back in the day, and then he finally was, you know, tried and sentenced, and he had to go be burned at the stake in Hadley, in his neighborhood where he preached the gospel, because obviously the, the church, uh, the, the, the corrupt leaders, thought it was most effective for people to see what happens if you live this way and preach these things. Um, but the whole time he was going all the way to London, this is the long trip, and all the way back, you know, come weeks and weeks. Um, they put a bag over his head when he was out public because they didn't want him talking to anybody or anybody seeing that anything that was contagious that could actually be picked up and, and make waves in the church. So when he was when he was coming back to be burned at the stake in his town, uh, Dr. Taylor said, Good people, I have taught you nothing but God's holy word and those lessons that I have taken out of God's blessed book, the Holy Bible. I have come here this day to seal it with my blood. He did this with a smile on his face knew what was going to happen. He was giving his overgarments and his boots to the people that lived in that village that he knew needed them. Um, and he had a very deep conversation with his wife. And he had children um, before he went to the, the stake that day when he was still in jail. And, and explained to them what he was doing. And of course his wife's thinking, is there a way to get out of this? And he's like, there's no way I can get out of this. I can't, I can't unsay the things that are true. And she understood. So how do people like that, Jesus, Stephen, and this is not one person that just happened, you know, these were, these were hundreds of people over the years and thousands of people over the years that, that had something so strong inside of them. They knew that I cannot, with my words, I cannot unsay the things that are true. I, I have conviction about this and I'm going to go to the grave with this. And then not only that, how did, how did they treat other people so kindly? It says that some of the guards that escorted this guy, when he would speak, they would start crying. Because they knew there was something righteous about this guy, and they couldn't, they couldn't handle it. But they're under orders, and if they try to support or let him free or whatever, then they're going to get persecuted. And they didn't have that faith and conviction. So it's just wild. I, I, love, I love that book. Then. It's good stuff. So let's read Matthew 16. Uh, I'm going to read a couple verses here. I think I have. Go to the next slide. This is, this is about authority. There we go. In Matthew 16, 18, he says, I say to you, this is after he asked Peter, he goes, who do you guys, who, who are they saying that I am? And they're saying, well, they say this and they say that. And he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, uh, you're, you're Christ, son of the living God. And, and he says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And then in a, a similar passage in John 20, 23, which we talked about during we were talking about the resurrection and ascension, it says Jesus, he took a, a deep breath and breathed into them, received the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, 
What are you going to do with them? Uh, that's from the message translation. The New Living Translation in that same passage in John 23, or John 20. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Uh, and that's, that's a New Living Translation. And then the voice says, you now have the mantle of God's forgiveness. As you go, you are able to share the life-giving power to forgive sins or to withhold forgiveness. So this is what Jesus communicated to them, to the disciples, as he was checking out and going to the other side. Uh, he said, receive my spirit. And when he said, receive, my, receive the Holy Spirit, he was telling them they have the power to forgive sins. Like that, those two things were, were very closely connected. In Matthew's version, he's, he's talking about before Jesus went to the cross. Uh, and when, when he tells that to Peter, he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Now, if you look in the context of Matthew 16, 17, 18, that's, it's not necessarily just talking about blinding the devil specifically. There's a lot of context there that says this is about forgiving sins. This is about, this is about what you retain, and your heart will be retained elsewhere. You have, you have the ability to, uh, to hold on to things or to let things go. So, um, in Matthew 17, he gives us an example of this. We're going we're gonna to go through several scriptures. In the following chapter of Matthew 17, this is when they, they come and they say, Hey, are you guys going to pay taxes to you and your master, this Jesus guy? And Peter says, Well, of course, yeah, of course we pay taxes. And so he says, in the next verse, As soon as they were in the house, well, I already said that, Simon, uh, what do you think? When a king levies taxes, who pays, his children or his subjects? That's what Jesus said to him. He answered his subjects. Jesus said the children get off free, right? But so we don't upset them needlessly, go down to the lake, cast a hook, and pull, pull in the first fish that bites. Open its mouth, and you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to the tax man. It will be good enough for both of us. In, in this environment, there's, there's a lot of passages here. <laughs> in this environment, Jesus is explaining to Peter you know, the things that are important. Uh, Peter's like, yeah, 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 he gives taxes, he pays taxes. And, and Jesus says, really, we're the children of the living king. We don't really need to pay taxes. We don't, we don't have to pay taxes because we're in, we live in a kingdom where our God, the Father, is the king. And he doesn't charge us taxes for Peter. Um, he says, but, so that we don't offend, then go and get these coins out of this fish's mouth and give them to him. So G Jesus gave us an example, and we're going to talk about other examples he gives, he gave us an example of, you do your part to not offend. That all of us are responsible to do that. Right. To, to not offend. Whether you're talking about people that are Christian, or people that are not Christian, or people that are old, or people that are young, or people that are whatever they are. It, you do your part not to offend. Um, but, even, when, uh, even when, the, when Jesus heals the blind man, he said... <laughs> They, they all come to him, and they're, they're amazed that this guy's been healed. But the Pharisees are more concerned that he forgave the dude's sins. Like, what, what authority, what power do you have to forgive sins? They, all, they can only see that as only being God's authority. That's it. So when Jesus is doing these miracles, Jesus is saying, your sins are forgiven, and be healed. Like, for Jesus, that, the forgiveness of sins comes first. Because you have to know that you're clean. You have to know that you're, you're not held responsible for all the things that you did and didn't do. You have to know that first to, for that healing to operate. Now, there's other examples in the Bible where miracles just happen. But they have more of a problem with Jesus saying your sins are forgiven than they did with him healing. And, of course, I don't know how well they did with the healing part. But it just none of it jived with them because they saw this as being something only God does. Well, of course, Jesus came to be God with us. God in the flesh, God incarnate, right? And so as he lived this out, he demonstrated these things, that, that life, uh, that we have the authority to forgive sins. So when Jesus was taking on authority, the, the challenge that the Pharisees had was if Jesus is a man and he's doing and saying these things, what does that mean for the rest of us? What does that mean for his disciples, those, those freaks that are following him around and trusting what he says? What, is, what does this mean? Like, they, it can't possibly be right. It's not any different than what we just said with the Catholic Church, you know, not being able to accept some new revelation uh, concerning the Scripture. 
Yeah, well, it was always there, but it, they didn't recognize it because of their systems of religion, whatever. Um, we have full authority to forgive sins. Jesus gave it to us. When we were just thinking about that, Brandy, I, the first two songs I was like, okay, it's good, yeah, grace. But then you got those two songs about champion and, and authority. I'm like, ah, oh, this is good stuff. Oh, I like this. Because we, we have, all, Jesus said, I have given you all authority. Now, if we, we can take authority to mean um, we can wave a magic wand and just fix everything all the time, or we can say, let's, let's use authority that God's given us to solve the problems that are, that are in my life. Yes, sir. And it starts with me. Yeah. So God first opened, you know, when Jennifer and I are praying, uh, when we're pursuing answers and truth, what do, what do we need to do? When I'm thinking about my life, I'm thinking, God, what do you need to do inside of me? So that I can be effective, so I can carry out that authority, so I can have the influence, so that people will trust me, so people will respect me. And regardless of, you know, I'm not going to always have everybody's approval. That I'll talk about that in a minute. I'm not, I'm not after approval. I'm talking about having influence, using the authority God gave me to do the things that God called me to do on the earth. And all of us have something. All of us have a piece somewhere to do that. Um, so that is what's important about our authority. Let me let me share about judging Matthew seven. Um, Two, I told you two of my friends this week had some uh, hang-ups issues because they, they felt very judged by others uh, and other Christian people, I should say. Um, and so as I was ministering to both of them, saying, hey, um, just pause for a minute before you get so excited and consider the, their perspective. One was a, a church group. Uh, they had some accusations about his wife and so forth. Another one was um, just breaking up relationship things and the, and the family was being judgmental. I said, just think about their perspective. From everybody involved, everybody you're thinking about, and think about what this, all, how this went down from their perspective. I said, I, th- I think that's what Jesus, that's why Jesus had such a, um, an attractiveness. Like when, when people, when Jesus spoke, people were drawn, they, they would like lean in and be like, makes sense. What he's saying is it doesn't fit in the category that I'm used to. It doesn't fit in my box. But there's something that he's saying that's powerful. There's something that he's doing. His essence, who Jesus is, is, is powerful. Um, and so there's something drawn to that. When when Peter, when, when he turned to his disciples and he said, hey, are you all going to go to, you know, after you fed about thousand in the boat thing, he said, are you all going to are y'all gonna leave? And Peter's like, you have the words of life. Where else are we going to go? Like that, this is this is powerful. Um, it's important that uh, that we understand that we we have been given life and truth, uh, just like Jesus had, and we need to listen to the words of life that Jesus speaks, that the word speaks over our life, and not listen to the criticism of others. Uh, because people have, definitely have their judgments and criticisms. So in Matthew chapter 7, um, I'll, I'll say Matthew 6 is the Beatitudes. It is the you know, Sermon on the Mount. It's where Jesus, Matthew 5 is Beatitudes. Jesus is saying all the things. But Matthew chapter 6 specifically, it's talking about our spiritual disciplines of giving and praying and fasting. And he, and he gives us all the good advice. Don't make your prayers long-winded. Don't, don't Give your money out in public so you drag your duffel bag and everybody sees how rich you are and how much you're sacrificing. Uh, don't don't fast and no, oh, I'm so hungry and you know, not wear your makeup and all the things that you know that um, that make you uh, look really holy and spiritual. Right? And so he goes right into Matthew chapter seven and he said uh, he says, and I'm going to read this again from uh, a different version because you've heard King James and you know, American Standard. Many times. Uh, this comes from the message. Yep. Uh, don't pick on people. Jump on their failures. Criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Amen. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. Yep. Amen. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you, when your own face is distorted by contempt? 
It's this whole traveling roadshow mentality all over again, <laughs> playing a holier than thou part instead of just living your part. Yep. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face, and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. <laughs> so, this scripture is not written in here so that we can launch it at other people and say, if you're a Christian, then you shouldn't judge. But there's nothing, nothing about the heart of this or nothing about Jesus' intent that is for us to hurl that at other people. It's completely intended for us to think about it internally. Yes. How do I judge people? How do I speak sharply when something doesn't go my way or when I have an emotional tick um, or when someone does something that's disappointing to me? How do I uh, manage my response? Uh, that, that's really what Jesus is talking about. And of course, he's preaching to the masses. So take it for what it's worth. Whether you're a religious person or you're way up in the hierarchy or you're a low person or you're not saved or you're you know, a heathen or whatever it is you are, take it for what it's worth. That, that's how Jesus is preaching. And again, um, I mentioned earlier, he had words of life. He had authority when he spoke. Uh, There's a lot of people that didn't like him. I was going to say there is, but not, not, uh, people not liking us. Uh, it's okay. We'll get, we'll get to that too. So, it's important when we, when we think about judgment, uh, all we can do is manage how we think about others. We can manage how we, how we uh, our expectations of people. We know that people fail. They sin. They mess up. They have disappointments. You can, you can look on any of the social media websites and you can see that people are just flawed. It's just, just the way it is. And, and it shouldn't discourage us from having community. Some, some people have a personality or experience where they feel they can withdraw from community in order to protect themselves from the bad things that are out there, the things that people say, whatever, judgment, the things. But there's, there's nothing, as far as Christians, scripturally, it's not, we're not intended, we're not created or, or designed to live alone. It's just, we're just not. We're designed to live in a community of believers where we all bring our gifts and talents, and we all take home the things we need uh, to be who we are. Uh, we have people that are introverts, people that are extroverts, people that, that are sensing and judging and thinking and all the personality things. Uh, we all have different ways of approaching life, but we are intended to be community. And, of course, judging does not help build a community. Um, and it's even worse from, from the heart of a uh, more, I guess I feel like I'm a mature Christian, um, it's even worse when I use my truth and try to go after the world. People that are secular, people that aren't saved, people that don't know Jesus, I should be even more gracious to those people instead of even more judgmental. Yep. They need all the help they can get because they don't have Jesus. So <laughs> you can say whatever you want. It, it doesn't bother me a bit because I know I have truth in my heart and in my life. I know I have Jesus and I know who Jesus is. I know who Jesus is inside of me. And I'm really sorry that you don't. So I have some compassion. This is the way Jesus treated people. I have some compassion for your mistakes, your knives that you throw or stab in the back, or for your you know, addiction problems, or for your whatever the things are. Uh, and, and sometimes people do really bad things. I and mean, we've had a, a mass you know, of shootings lately, and it's, it, it just hurts our hearts, all of us. It doesn't matter if you're Christian or not Christian. You just, it just hurts. Why does this have to happen? Um, but if Jesus was here in the flesh, walking, if this was his day, walking the earth before he died and resurrected, then he would, he would give us comfort to know how to deal with the things um, and, and give us hope that in our communities, which are all over the place, um, that we can be a light and give hope even though there are bad things that are happening. But this is with, even though you know, gun control and all the things are a big political issue and, and there's, it seems just vile. Other countries don't have school shootings the way we do in America. Even though it just seems like such a modern thing, it is not new. People have been killing others and doing destructive things to others forever. Yep. Forever. Yep. Ever since the beginning of man. Uh, Cain, at the beginning of creation, Cain killed his brother because he thought God liked his sacrifice better. Yeah. Jealousy. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Yep. It just, it doesn't, there's none of this makes sense. And it's been like, it was like that for years, all the way till now. So even though it's, uh, even though it's, it's very difficult for us to see, watch the news and hear the things, it's the same problem in the world that has always existed, that God has protected us from by giving us His Son. Um, as far as fixing ourselves, 
so that we could help others get fixed. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean fixed. My wife, you know, tells me you don't need to fix everything. I'm not talking about fixing everything. Uh, God, God, God's fix was Jesus, and that people need Jesus. Uh, so, all right. So uh, that's that's the thing about judgment. It, it, I love the way this, this scripture said uh, that critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. Yep. Um, it. We, we have probably have our own examples of that. Chris. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, yesterday, Dad and I were having coffee. And we were talk, he was talking about um, fixing somebody who was severely overweight. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, he goes, they need to just quit. They need to just you know, eat less food. They need to just, mm -hmm. and I said, but you've never had a problem with yeah. that. Right. So you don't understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone who might, might not ever have any issues with anger doesn't understand why you don't just calm down. Yeah. Why, why you just don't yeah. let that go. So right. everybody's got something and, mm -hmm. and when you try and, you know, yeah. it, you're you're trying to make them, mm -hmm. what they're doing is worse than what you do. Yeah. So yep. see, it's really easy to see it in other people, not so much in yourself. But yeah. everybody, yeah. you know, we were just talking about that yesterday. It's true. Do you have something to share? Is that Harper or Piper? <laughs> I don't know the difference. <laughs> All right. So I mentioned something about our authority. Our authority uh, from Christ gives us the authority to forgive sins, and it is it is ultimately that is the authority that makes humanity um, beautiful. It, it's, that's what Jesus brought to us. And then when it comes to judging, we we have. We do have control over how we view others. And it may not be an overnight thing that we just fix all of our problems, all of our perspectives, but it's something we should strive towards. Say, Jesus, how did you see that woman when she was caught in adultery and they were about to throw stones at her because that was the law and that's what she deserved? How did, how did you overcome seeing her as that loose woman? Oh, yeah. We, we play Scrabble at days. We learn many words for a loose woman. But how do you see her as more than, more than just that loose woman? Um, and, and actually show some compassion. Thanks, Chris. That's a word. We all know what a word is. There's lots of them. There's like, there's like 20 or 30 different words you can use in Scrabble. What's that mean? It's a loose woman. Oh, I'm just kidding. Dig out a hole. Yeah. I'm serious yeah. about Scrabble. I know all the words. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so the last thing I want to mention is, is overcoming betrayal. And so uh, one of the things that, that Ron the Priest shares in this book, and if you've heard him preach at all or, or met him uh, in the past, his point of this book, overcoming betrayal, has nothing to do with anybody else. It, everything in this book is about me. It's about me understanding who I am in Christ so that I can face the adversity of the world. Amen. Now, it, what I think is beautiful is we, don't, we can't just wish away all our problems. We can't just say, I have Jesus, so now we have world peace, and it's all good. <laughs> like, 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 it's not, it's not, you know, just ignore, everything is gone, Every, you know, there's no problems. But the people step in the back, people say evil yeah. things. People, people do things that are unkind. Yeah. Um, and, there's, and there's violence and cruelty in the world that we have to deal with. Like, there. There's a lot of different people with a lot of different nonprofits and school teachers that are, you know, administrators and all, police officers, uh, nurses in the schools, psychiatrists, lots of people that are trying to deal with the problems of the world. We can't ignore them, um, but we have to understand that uh, un the way I let it affect me is, is my responsibility. It is my responsibility. So he explains. Uh, I mentioned it earlier that that Satan was was cast out from God's inner circle. And he wasn't content with just having ownership of the earth. He wanted to take Adam and Eve with him. And he wanted all of humanity to be derailed from intimacy with God. And so, if, what Ron says in his book is that if Adam would have, had, would have maintained the intimacy with God that he started with, that God was, it was free, it was all right there, right? In the garden, everything he could ever want, Adam, it was there. And then he said, here, let me give you a helper, her, her name's Eve. And and you're going to do life together. It's going to be beautiful. Um, and and you, have, you have the need of nothing. When he did that, and then the snake slid in there and said, eh, Did God really say that you would die if you ate from that tree? 
Then things start going haywire, and Adam didn't jump, you know, got it. You, we're good. We, we're, we're close, we're tight. I messed up. I didn't intervene and stop the, the madness. And um, I, I'm sorry that, that we got to this point, but I know who I am because you created me, and it's going to be okay. I'm sorry. Instead of that, it was, huh? <laughs> right. And it didn't, it didn't fix anything, and that the problem of humanity, right? So Ron's saying that if he would have understood his identity, who God made him to be, this is of course before Christ, the first Adam, right? Then, then that, that would have been, it would have been stopped right there. But because he didn't, then he gave place to the devil and let the devil steal from him. Right. So then Jesus came along years later and said, all right, people. Now, he's not just talking to Adam, but the Bible calls him the, the last Adam. Not the second Adam. calls him the last Adam. Because there is no need for another one. The last Adam. This is who we are. This is who God created us to be. And he shows us that. Um, and gives us that understanding. Betrayal is often perceived and not based on facts. Right. And when, and when you get into the story, I, okay, I, can, I can give a simple example of us at home. When two children, well, let's pick the younger children because, you know, it's normal. When one says, this is what happened, and another says, no, that's not what happened. This happened. It can go on forever. And you don't get to the, you know, you don't get to the, uh, the resolution very easily. Uh, typically, mom or dad is smart enough to realize that you're probably both not telling the full truth. You know? And let's, let's go back to the facts here. Uh, but, but, each child can get really spun up and, and even really truly believe that what they're saying is 100% right. Yep, that is true. Yep. I cannot see it from another perspective. I, everything I told you, Mom, is exactly true. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the way it happened. I, mean, I love the Adventures and Odyssey show that we listen to and they have their, they have their ideas of how everything went, went wrong. Um, and, and the other child says, Dad, in the Adventures and Odyssey episode, they go into separate rooms. The boy goes with Dad, the girl goes with Mom. And they tell their stories and they're very far apart very far apart but you you have to look okay what are the facts here and you don't always know that i mean you're still probably like that you don't know so in the world in our everyday relationships at work or in our families or here at church or wherever else we go uh, at school the you know the school saying something the school board's made a decision on something the teacher whatever did this to my kid and my kid's not as perfect and my kid doesn't have those problems and whatever you know and of course the enemy is all of a sudden the school and administration Whatever it is, the facts aren't always that easy to see. Mm -hmm. But the truth that we do know is what can I do? How can I react? And sometimes it is important for a parent to put their foot down and say, teacher, you're wrong. You know, and I'm not going to let you whatever. Uh, sometimes it's important to put your foot down and pick a side. One of your kids is telling the truth and one of them is not. I mean, sometimes that happens. and Sometimes they're both fine. But the important part for us when it comes to betrayal is that um, our first source of approval should be the Father, not, not someone else. And so he explains in, in his book, he explains uh, the more value that you place on someone's opinion, the greater a voice of approval that person has. Um, and that's that's not something we should give to another person. No. We, we need to keep uh, the Father as the one who gives us that, that source of approval. So in, in closing this, Matthew 18 says, go to the next verse, um, Peter's talking about forgiving. Of course, we started in Matthew 16 and 17, and now we're, we're finishing up here in Matthew 18. Um, he said, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I still forgive him? Up to seven times? Because he's getting this idea. Peter's, his, his wheels are turning. He's getting this idea that Jesus is a forgiver. So how do I emulate this? Seven times? I mean, should I forgive somebody seven times before I kind of give up and throw him to the curb? And Jesus says, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times, or seven times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts of his slaves. Now, if you go read that whole passage, Matthew 18, 21, 25, it tells the story of uh, a man who was, who owed a debt. His higher master authority forgave his debt, and then he went out into the streets and got very angry about someone who owed much smaller debt to him. And say, oh yeah, you're paying every dime of it. Mm -hmm. so like, you read the scripture, you're just like, it doesn't make sense. 
I mean, it does make sense because that's the way we act as people. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be a parable in the Bible if it didn't connect with with who we are. Like we we do that. We get mad because someone said or did something to us when we would do much worse on a much smaller level, going over petty things. Um, so, verse thirty four and thirty five in the next next slide there. And his master moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he would repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your own heart or from your heart. And sometimes in the past uh, we have viewed this as you know I have to be perfectly clean every time I come to God, or He's going to strike me with lightning, or He's going to uh, I'm, I'm in danger of going to hell. If I, if I took my last breath in the next five seconds, I, I may go to hell. It's not. I don't think that's the, the point of what Jesus is saying here in this story. He's saying that if you don't learn how to forgive your brother, then you really need to question if you even have a love of God inside of you. And he says that also in John, 1 John 2. He says, if you, if you hate your brother, you don't have the love of God inside of you. So it's not, this is not a matter of, am I saved now? Am I not saved now? Am I saved? It's, we should be pursuing, what is the love that allows me to forgive that guy? That, that's what we should be pursuing every day is what is the love inside of me that allows me to forgive others and not be so judgmental and not be so quick to speak. Scripture tells us to be slow to speak. You know, quick to hear, slow to speak. And it all goes together with this love and this forgiveness that we uh, are wired with. We don't feel like we're wired with it sometimes, but we are wired that way. That's the way God designed us. Because uh, we are designed to be like Christ. That's the way Jesus is wired so let me give you a little example, this just to tone it down and have some fun. Um, my, my goal, when I share with you guys from up, up here speaking something, my goal is not to beat everybody over the head and say, you are doing this wrong. If you just open your eyes and see this, you're, you know, your life will be better. Because you all, many of you are just as mature as I am, and we've been doing this forever, and it's not like I'm kind of teach you all the new things. But my goal is that if you get one little thing that helped you this week to help overcome something that you're going through, great. Because that, that we need the word all the time. We're going to need it until we die. So that's my goal. My goal is not to try to condemn or beat you up or whatever. I don't, I don't care about that. Um, so think about we're at Scott Springs graduation today and um, I'm a 50 year old woman and we the, the microphone stopped working at the high school. Alright. And I'm a, I'm a 50 year old woman who has um, a couple double A batteries in my car and they're way out in the parking lot, parked way down the end of the lot because I was late or whatever. Um, and and those batteries are the only way we're going to keep the graduation going. Like that's that's it. It's going to save the day, all right? And then Ava's like, "Oh, um, Miss Susan, my name's Susan." Now. She said, "I can run and get them really fast. I'm really fast. I can go get them, and and you don't have to go out there." Susan could look at the girl and say, "Are you saying I'm fat and out of shape?" No, she's saying she's fast and right. she can go get the batteries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what? Don't that's, don't put words in her mouth. Don't don't make assumptions about her judgment towards you. Yeah. Now, if Isaac, the almost nineteen year old, um, <laughs> says, "Hey, Miss Susan, if you give me your keys, I can go get them for you, so you don't have to go." Do you think I'm incapable? <laughs> do, do I look at my legs broke? Do you think I'm in a wheelchair? No, I'm just trying to be helpful. So you said you've got the batteries, and we need those batteries to make this thing happen today, and I can run and get them, so you don't have to go. Like, I just want to help. Um, or the 45-year-old Chris says, I know you've got some mobility challenges, because I've seen you walk around, and you've seen you breathe heavy, you know, and, and you can't, you can't, uh, you have a hard time getting just from your car to here the first time. I don't want to make you do it again, you know. Whatever it is, I'm, I'm just saying, whatever it is that people say to us, we, we have to have some identity that, and, and, and understanding of ourselves. If I'm 20 or 30 pounds overweight and I breathe really heavy when I walk from the front of the church to the back of the church, then maybe I need to be aware that, that people see that. It's okay. And if somebody wants to help me out, it's okay. You know? <laughs> yeah, listen, Peggy, Peggy's pretty, pretty good about this. She's like, you want to help me? You go right ahead. That's exactly no, I'm just using that as an example for a thousand things, the situations we're in. We, we need other people, and we have weaknesses, and we're not all, we, no one person has everything. And can't fix it all and do it all by ourselves. 
we instead of looking at, can you believe that person said that about me? Or I, I can't believe you're talking to me that way. We should look at, okay, maybe, because Jesus would see this and others, right? Maybe this person is actually has is trying to do something good, even though they didn't say it right. Um, or maybe this person is trying to, trying to help me. Or maybe this person needs, I heard Rex say, maybe this person just needs a blessing, and they want to be a blessing, and they need a blessing, and I'm not going to take it from them. Or whatever the case is. But there's, there's a thousand situations. We have, um, we have control over how we receive others and how we understand others. And Jesus does not give us any examples or he was quick to judge. He told, he told one woman, he said, yeah, that's not the husband I'm talking about. He's like, yeah, you've had five. Yeah. He's like, I'm talking about the other one. Like, so he, he didn't just ignore the facts. But he didn't come at her like, oh my gosh, how are you still alive? <laughs> like, but he, he approached someone and looked, he looked into her soul and said, I see that you're, you're, you have some serious grinding of things going on in your soul. And I, if you'll just eat the bread, you know, drink the water, there is great life available to you. So just taste it. Yes. You know, so that, that's available to us all the time. I love you all. <laughs> yep, we're done. So I hope you, I hope you enjoy.